what an incredible finish. What an unbelievable leg from Cabo Verde to Cape Town. 18 days of racing and the first three boats finished within 25 minutes of each other. And that's not even to mention that in that last 24 hours, the lead changed places so many times. And if you just looked at those results, you'd assume that that's pretty much the whole story. Team Holson PRB are fast. Guyu Environment Team Europe seem to be slow. But if you have been following the twists and turns of leg two, you will know that that is far from the truth. There is so much going on over these 18 days that we thought it'd be a good idea to pull out what should be the big conclusions about what we've learned from our team. So here are my top five lessons from leg two. Sail selection is everything. From the very beginning of this leg, two boats left the dock with a disadvantage. Team Militia and Team Holson PRB, they elected not to take a spinnaker, good for going downwind in light winds. And those first three days of leg two was all about going downwind in light winds. The teams that did take a spinnaker were fast and efficient and it seemed to be easy for them. So why not take a downwind spinnaker? Well, our teams are limited. They're only allowed to use 11 sails in total from the start of this edition all the way to the grand finale in Geneva. So if you don't take a spinnaker, you leave a slot open to replace one of your sails with something brand new or bring in a different type of sail if you want to. It's a delicate balancing game between short-term games, long-term strategy, and you've got to manage all the risks in between. If you get it right and you are sailing with the right sail for the right conditions, it will get you ahead. Clouds can be cruel. There are a few ways to go fast and there are lots of ways to go slowly. Like Guyu Environment Team Europe losing 100 miles relative to the other boats in just 12 hours because of one bank of clouds. And we've heard our sailors talk about using the edges of clouds to hop from one gust to another using the wind that's generated there. And the navigators can download images of the clouds and plot a course much like working out what stepping stones to go on to cross a river. But if you get it wrong and the clouds drift by and you miss it, or worse, you sail underneath a cloud stuck in that dead zone, you drift, your sails flap, and your lead evaporates. When you are fast, you are really fast. We knew that the Amokas would have the potential for some fantastic speeds, and we have seen that with the sailors boasting of going 36 knots plus at times, and potentially some new 24-hour records as well. 11th Hour Racing Team has already clocked up 542 miles, sailed in that period on leg two, with the wind just behind the beam or about 110 degrees, flat water, and with the wind speed of around 25 or maybe 30 knots, these boats will be establishing new records. Team Militia owns downwind sailing in waves. It doesn't look like the narrow, sleek, wave-piercing bow of many racing yachts, but that's exactly the point. The bow of Team Militia has been designed fuller, bigger and blunter. Downwind in waves, blasting along where nose diving is a really big risk. For Team Militia, their bow is higher and they ride over the waves and they can consistently keep their speed up. With it, they sailed from last into first. Is there a downside to this? Of course there is. In light winds, the boat lumbers through the water rather than graciously carving between the waves. But anytime it's downwind, anytime it's big waves, this boat's gonna be fast. And remind me, what are the conditions for the Southern Ocean? The final few miles are everything. One thing we saw clearly on leg two was just how vital it was to play out those last few moments as you get in close to the coast with absolute precision. Out into the sea, the wind is really predictable. In close to the finish line, the winds get very fluky. And all of those battles that we saw from Cabo Verde to the doldrums down into the South Atlantic didn't really seem to count for much when we got into those final 100 miles. Guyo Environment Team Europe, 200 miles behind, and they close it down to 70, 60, maybe 50 miles before the finish. Biotherm, languishing in fourth place, managed to carve all the way through into second. All those miles from the start line are important. It sets you up tactically to make those big pushes into the finish. But it's those final pushes. It's that last roll of the dice. It's that last tactical move, which are really the key to doing well in this race. For all our teams in the ocean race, they will be learning these lessons as well. And some of them they can do something about. Other ones, those decisions have been made. Like Team Militia's bow, for example. You're not going to be able to take your boat back into the shed and re-carve the front of it at this late stage. 
It's going to come down to what the sailors can do with the equipment that they have and what decisions they can make. And the racing starts again pretty soon. In just under two weeks' time, we're going to have the import race and the leg three departure from Cape Town. That's going to be live on Eurosport, where you're going to be able to follow all the action, cheer on your favourite teams, and see who's got the next moves right.